after 40 days of repentance through the season of Lent and the, the somber, most somber day of the year, Good Friday, we arrive today, Easter Sunday, and so I invite you in a crescendo of joy to respond with the traditional Easter greeting. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Our opening hymn will stand on the last verse. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Spend a moment in silent reflection upon our sinfulness and upon the grace of God in forgiving our sins through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most, Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
we justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. To God. Be glory and peace to all the earth. Good will from God in heaven, proclaim that Jesus heard. We praise and bless you, Father, your holy name we sing. Our thanks for your great glory. you gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of the enemy. Grant that all our sin may be drowned through daily repentance, and that day by day we may, raise, that we may arise to live before you in righteousness and purity forever. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, chapter 65. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. 
For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite all the Sunday school children to come on up and sing along with the choir this morning. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to destroy to be destroyed is death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please rise for the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel.
the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you when he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the hymn. and mercy and peace to each one of you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. So there were several women who had been followers of Jesus. Mary Magdalene, whom we're told, had had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. Joanna, who was the wife of one of the top officials in the court of King Herod. Mary, the mother of James, that might be referring to Jesus' half-brother James, in which case this would be who we think of as the Virgin Mary, and then other women, plural, so at least two others. We're not told all who they are, exactly how many, but quite a little group that gathers. They had been the ones who helped support Jesus during his ministry. They had followed him down to Jerusalem from Galilee, so they were all in, weren't they? And just that previous Friday, they had watched him die an excruciating and horrible death, nailed to the cross. And so now it was early Sunday morning. The Sabbath was over, 
and they made their way quietly in the early morning to the tomb where Jesus was buried, bringing the spices that would customarily be packed around underneath the linens around the corpse. And they found something they did not expect to find, and they did not find what they did expect to find. The stone that was in front of the tomb had been rolled away. And inside the tomb, the body of Jesus, whom they had watched be put there just that past Friday, was not there. And the scripture says that they were perplexed about this. Perplexed. They were in doubt. They were at a loss for what to do. Uncertain. Not knowing where to turn. I I wonder how many of us sometimes feel perplexed. If you happen to be a guest today, I can just imagine, because I can remember times where I visited other churches, and you're always worrying a little bit about how they do things when you're not familiar with it or uncertain, right? I was always afraid of sitting when everybody else was standing, or even worse, standing when everybody else was sitting. And I had a hard time going back and forth from the paper to the book and the book back to the, the paper, and I didn't always know all the songs. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to go up for communion. I wasn't sure which way to go. I wasn't sure which way to go back. Oh, and if I sat at the end of the aisle and the offering plate came by, do I pass it forward or do I pass it backwards or pass it back to the person that gave it to me? Going to church can be a little perplexing. I I admit that. And all this Christianity stuff can be perplexing, too. There are so many different churches out there. I would guess many of you drove by a whole bunch of them just to get here today. What's the difference between all of them? There are so many beliefs and doctrines, ideas. Who has time to sort all of that stuff out? And certainly life as a person who wants to be a disciple of Jesus can be perplexing. I would guess that many, if not all of you here, have brothers or sisters or children or grandchildren or someone close to you who doesn't seem to show any interest or inclination to know the Lord or to walk with him. And it's perplexing to know what to do about it. Do you, do you press the issue with them? Do you keep bringing it up? Or do you just pray for them and leave it at that? Of course, if you ask them, spiritually, they'd say, I'm fine. But it's kind of like asking little kids if they want to go to the dentist. They're, they'll say, I'm fine. I, but the, the word of God is telling us that they may not be fine. They may be spiritually in peril. So what do you do for someone that you love? Do you push it or, or not? can be perplexing. And so the women at the tomb are perplexed. They're in this dilemma. What do we do? When all of a sudden, they see two men in dazzling apparel. Now, it doesn't tell us actually who they are, but you know who they are, don't you? They are, of course, angels. God sends angels when he has special missions for them to do on his behalf. The book of Hebrews tells us that many have entertained angels unaware I would not be at all surprised if some of you sitting right here today have at some point in your life met people or talked to people or had people do something for them and we shall discover when we get to the other side of eternity that they weren't people at all. But God had put an angel in your life right at the point where you really needed it. There are special interventions by angels where God makes it clear that Something in their appearance or their impressiveness of their presence is to reflect his great holiness. So whilst we often may entertain angels unaware, there are times when they are made most aware. There's a brightness to them which is not natural. There's a reflection of holiness which is so striking that it says in our text that the women bow their faces to the ground. Now this could possibly be... I wouldn't be surprised if it's just a reverential bowing, but I wonder if it might not be something else. You know, in the presence of great holiness, it can be so overwhelming that a person can be literally overcome and fall down, almost like passing out. In the book of Revelation, when John sees Jesus at the beginning, he falls to the ground, it says, as though dead. Remember the group of people that came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. And when he said, I am he, it says they fell to the ground as if they were dead. I saw this many, many years ago. Someone that was in the presence of the Lord, that they just fell to the ground. And when we helped them up, they said they were conscious, but they just... 
they, their feet gave out from under them. They couldn't stand up anymore. And so perhaps these women have fallen in the presence of the holiness of these angels. But as they start to regain their senses again, the angels speak and they have a message from God for these women. Why do you seek the living among the dead? One of my favorite movies is uh, The Robe. Has anybody seen it? Oh, I see a few heads nodding. All right. I know it's old. From 1953, it was the top grossing uh, movie in that year, but I love it. I think it's great music, great cinematography, great action, and there's an interesting story behind it too, which you may not know. The, the lead role is played by Richard Burton, who's a Roman tribune that is in charge of the detail that crucifies Jesus Christ. But by the end of the movie, his character finds forgiveness and becomes a Christian follower of Christ. But in real life, Richard Burton was an atheist. He didn't like the movie. He didn't like making the movie. They say he smoked packs of cigarettes all while it was being filmed. And he had an extramarital affair with the leading lady of the film, too, Gene Simmons, whose husband at the time, Stuart Granger, is said to have threatened him with a gun if he didn't stay away from his wife. On the other hand, the Roman emperor in the movie who persecutes the Christians and who at the end of the movie executes Burton's and Simmons's characters because they were Christians, played by Jay Robinson, who in the years following that fell into heroin use, went to prison, got out of prison, couldn't get a job, but later became a sincere and legitimate Christian and turned to God to turn his life around and make a comeback. The bad guy in the movie was the good guy. The good guy in the movie was the bad guy. Interesting. But I brought it up because my favorite part in the movie is a song sung by one of the characters, taken right from, from sections of scriptures, where she recounts the visit of the women to the empty tomb, and she sings the words of these angels. Why seek ye the living among the dead? And every time I listen to that song, I get goosebumps. Why seek ye the living among the dead? And then they deliver the rest of their message, which you could almost sum up, really, in one word. Verse 6, remember. Remember that way back in Galilee, Jesus himself had told you that he must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified on the third day. He must. That means it was necessary. He had to do it. His death on the cross, as terrible and horrible as that was, that was the place where he made the sacrifice for our sins. That was where he took our sins upon himself and paid the debt of the wrath of God that we deserved. He had to do that. And also he had to rise. He must rise again. Because his resurrection from the dead meant that his sacrifice was accepted. That everything he said and did was vindicated. That the power of sin and sin's obligation to the law, that, that every breaker of the law must suffer the penalty, now that power is removed. And so the penalty is removed for us. Death could not hold Jesus. He broke forth from its grasp and has risen from the dead never to die again. And by breaking its power, he grants now to all of us who believe on him that same immunity to per the permanence of death. We who embrace Christ by faith, we who have had hearts renewed by the Holy Spirit, we may die, but death will not hold us either. We also will be resurrected from the dead like Jesus. Do you remember? Do you remember when Jesus told you that? Jesus said so many things that were so deep and so proud, profound. I can imagine the disciples rarely followed what he was saying. You can just imagine when he told his disciples that he was going to die and rise again in three days. And they must have said, oh boy, this is pretty heavy stuff. But they forgot it. It went in one ear and out the other. And so now the message from the angels is that they should remember. Remember that he said this. And look at verse 8. Do you see what they did? They remembered. They did remember. They remembered his words. You may never have a dazzling angel appear to you. Oh, that would be nice if one did, wouldn't it? If an angel showed up in dazzling apparel with a powerful presence that would knock you right down on your keister, wouldn't that be something? That would get all of our wayward relatives back in the church, wouldn't it? That would convince all the skeptics and persuade the doubting and refocus the distracted. That would let people who are really busy know what they ought to be busy about. But not only does that not seem to happen very much, let's not be fooled. 
The angels were messengers from God, bringing, him, bringing them a message that God had sent. And God has now chosen in his divine purposes to make his primary messengers not dazzling appearances of angels, but his words, the scripture. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Well, when you go to the word of God, to the scripture, you're not seeing the words of dead men. You're seeing the words of a living God. And that is where he brings you his message. It's not the appearance of the angel. It's the remembering of the words which changes everything for these women. Remember. Remember his words. So this year, as things around your life perhaps get more perplexing instead of less perplexing, as the economy puts more pressure on you, as crime rates rise, as divisions are tearing our culture apart, as we have crazy men in Russia and North Korea who can push a button and change our world in ways we don't even want to think of, I want to challenge you in that perplexity to remember the words of Jesus. Maybe if you're not in the habit of doing it, Pick up a Bible and just read a little bit from the words of Jesus each week. Or if you've never done it before, or if you haven't done it in a long time, maybe this year, commit to take just, just one hour a week, just one hour a week, and come for Bible study, or come down for adult Sunday school, and hear more of the words of Jesus. Or if you work a lot, or you're on the road all the time, maybe get a recording of the Bible, so you can listen to just a little bit of God's word instead of the radio or some music or those ear pod things. Remember. Remember what he told you. Remember his words. Like the women, remember. Amen. I invite you to rise and join me in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll now receive you.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. With great joy and thanksgiving, we praise you, our Father in heaven, for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer. By his life, death, and resurrection, he has granted us everlasting life with you. He has opened the way for us to know you forever and to live with confidence that you hear us when we pray. For he lives, he lives, who once was dead. In a world full of chaos and confusion, we find refuge in the supreme truth that you are on your throne as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Instead of foolishly looking to this world for our peace and purpose, help us, O oh Father, to look to Jesus, who is seated in power at your right hand. For he lives all glorious in the sky. He lives we bring to you, faithful Lord, the needs of our lives and the concerns of those we love. For those who are hurting, doubting, or in dismay, grant that the message of Christ's resurrection bring restoration and peace. For we know he lives my hungry soul to feed. There are many among us who are in need, O Lord, for the sick, suffering, hurting, ailing, for all those who need your healing touch that we name to you in our hearts right now. Help them to know that he lives to comfort me when faint. He lives when the troubles of life seem overwhelming, steady us with your presence, gracious God. Be the rock on which your church is built and through whom we confidently share the good news of Christ's resurrection with the world he died to save. When we waver, help us to remember he lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to Death was not the end for Jesus, neither is it the end for those who trust in you. Give peace, hope, and the certainty of the coming day of resurrection to all those who mourn and grieve, especially those who celebrate their first Easter with a dear loved one celebrating in your triumphant presence. We are confident that he lives my mansion to prepare. He lives to bring me safely there. What a blessing it is to be in your house today, Lord God, as we rejoice in the resurrection of our Savior. His victory over sin, death, and the devil is the reason we exult in you this day and every day, knowing that he lives, and while he lives, I'll sing. He lives, my prophet, priest, and king. He lives all glory to his name. He lives, my Jesus, still the same. Oh, the sweet joy of the sentence is, I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. Will you please rise as we continue with our service of Holy Communion? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And you lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give them thanks and praise. It is indeed meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying he has destroyed death, and by his rising again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Jesus Christ, on the same night on which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup when he had supped, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it 
in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Father, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. 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 Amen.
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for the forgiveness of all your sins.
let us pray. Father in heaven, through your Son's body and blood, the blessings of the first Easter day have been given to us again on this Easter day. Confident that our Savior is with us now and remains with us always, help us to go forth and share the hope of the resurrection so that all people may know your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn.
blessing to celebrate Easter with you this morning. Thank you so much for being here or for tuning in to the live stream. May the Easter joy and grace of Christ be and abide with you and in your homes all this week. Uh, thank you to all that made that marvelous breakfast. Uh, that was that was tremendous. I, I might need to be taken out of here in a wheelbarrow later. It was so marvelous. And thank you, Gail, for filling in for George while he's gone. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder that the men's prayer breakfast is this Wednesday at 8 o'clock downstairs. All men, always welcome. It just lasts about an hour and five minutes, so it's not very long. And uh, the uh, Wednesday night Bible study kicks off again this Wednesday at 6.30 downstairs, 6.30 to uh, about 7.20. We're usually, usually done with that. Uh, and then one last announcement. After all the great work and beautiful uh, flowers that they put up here. It's time to take the flowers home. So we'd really like it if all of you would come up and grab some flowers. There's a basket in the back where if you'd like to put in a free will, oh, it's, it'll be right here. If you'd like to put in a donation, um, that would be nice to help defray the cost. But otherwise, really, we want to see you take them and enjoy them. So please make sure that uh, you grab, grab some flowers on the way. Any other announcements? Then go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.